Wilcox. Well, hello everybody and welcome to the next episode of How to Build a Theatre. My name is Phil Wilcox. And my name is Edward McMillan. And we are charting the process to the creation of an English language theatre in Brussels. Right, today we have a very special guest. Uh, jobbing, we've called this, uh, the sort of working title of this episode is The Jobbing Actor. So, very excited to get on to our guest. But first of all, Ed, of course, our uh, monthly catch up with the bridge, everything bridge. Tell me what's going on. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. My, my, uh, my cue to rant away. Um, what is going on since last time? I mean, we're, we're still in the stage where we're, contra- we're negotiating contracts with different venues. Uh, and so that kind of means, and, and working out lots of logistics for potential activities to be doing in the first half of 2023, uh, which is kind of exciting because it means we're setting up stuff, but it is also at the same time a little bit boring because we're dealing with all the admin that's associated with that. Um, and 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 we're not quite getting to the fun artistic side of things of actually like um, um, preparing exactly what we're going to do. We're more in this in the setup stage. OK, this is we, we need to get this venue sorted. We need to get this permit. We need to to sort out this logistical thing. Um, yeah. And that's kind of what has been consuming our time for the moment. But I guess at the same time, so we're looking to to already uh, at our workshops for 2023. And I'm really happy that we're bringing back our ACT workshops, uh, which were really popular in 2020, uh, this year, in 2022. Uh, so we've got uh, a series of nine of them lined up, uh, which we will be announcing soon, probably by the time this podcast goes out. When will they, uh, when will alongside, they happen, roughly? When? Yeah. They will happen between, well, from January on right. Sundays. New Year time. Yes. Mm. yes, New Year, exactly. From January, currently until March, we'll probably have another set cool. post-Easter as well. Fabulous. And what sort of, yeah. can you spill the beans on any of the venues that you've been looking at? Are there any little wet our appetite? So all of them are non-traditional theatrical spaces. And the most exciting of the venues that we are looking at is a rather large space um, which is currently used as a a metal working factory or something like that um, but it's a it it's it, it there's it, it offers a big square meterage so the area or, and it's very high ceilings it's it's a work uh, like a warehouse workshop space thing but we have other options as well like we're looking at um a temporary occupation building which is quite popular here so so it's an it's an old office block for example um yeah i can't actually give you too much information though no and of course that would spoil things for the surprise warehouses are great aren't they because they're just this massive blank canvas but i guess there's quite a lot of uh certainly if they're still functioning quite a lot of clean up and health and safety regs that sort of stuff to to sort out Yes, I mean there are there are quite a lot of empty warehouses also in Brussels. I mean there's a lot of empty space. I so there's a there's an organisation here. Well, there's a, there's a few organisations that have clubbed together and they've created something called the the twentieth commune. So so Brussels is made up of nineteen communes or boroughs, and uh, there is such a, a, a massive amount of empty spaces here that they've they've set up this campaign, the twentieth camp. 20th commune to raise awareness of the amount of em- of spaces or buildings that are just empty in the city uh, most of them are office blocks but as i said you have a lot of empty warehouses as well but yes it, there there is a certain amount of cleanup um and health and safety yes considerations to take into account for sure very exciting and what about next uh, productions is there any news on on what the next uh, bridge production is going to be or Yes, I again cannot Good. say too much, but I can tell you oh. that I am talking with various directors uh, about uh, a few different productions. So we have three different productions that we're looking at right now and hopefully 
at least one of them will come to fruition. I think I said that last time, actually. Um, but I'm yes, I'm very guarded at the moment because uh, because maybe yeah, because I don't know which one will come to fruition. It's it's in a way sometimes just to do with the logistics. It's dates basically. If we can get them in the mm. calendar, it's also about whether we can uh, get the rights to the productions that we want, um, and and whether we can uh, make it work in the spaces that we have in mind. Mm-hmm. All very exciting stuff. And what, what is there anything uh, Christmas related for the bridge? No, actually, we uh, haven't really, <laughs> really uh, got that. Uh, got, no, basically, we're going to do we're, we're looking to do, though, you know, Christmas here, I guess, everywhere is always very, very busy in any case. So we have the end of this current musical theatre weekend workshops uh um, but that's not necessarily Christmas related, but we will be organising, um, you know, uh, something that's really nice about this whole project is the community aspect, actually, and and this burgeoning, uh, yeah, community of people, theatre lovers that are kind of collecting around and, and we love getting people together when we can so we decided instead of we wanted to do that so have a kind of just a social event basically but we're not going to do that this side of christmas we'll do it after christmas because christmas is always really busy so yes so during this podcast series so far we have been looking at various different aspects of theatre making really really varied and I have kind of shied away from getting the more obvious choices of actors onto the podcast because I think they are often the most visible part of of the of of the whole industry and I think it's it's interesting to put a, a spotlight on on other less visible parts However, I've decided that actually what would be really interesting um, is to hear a little bit about what it actually means to be an actor away from perhaps the acting side of things and what it means for 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 one's life and one's one's career in a way. So I've invited onto the show um, uh, uh, a lady who is based in Brussels. She's originally from South Africa and her name is uh, Michelle Scott and she is a very well uh, uh, established actor. So welcome onto the show, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here with you. Great to have you on. Really excited about this chat. (laughs) I think just to uh, get us going, Phil, would you like to do the honours and... Yes, as Subject a, our participants. A, a subject, the, the, a, a section of the show that we, we missed last time, which uh, because we, we got straight mm. into the conversation, I think, and we didn't go back. Um, but Michelle, we usually just sort of start off with a little warm up, a little sort of, you know, roll your shoulders, get into the scene. But it, it's actually just some um, okay. uh, quick fire questions. Now, I always caveat these with the fact that if, if I was asked these, I'd, I'd blank. My mind just does not work, but I like to see. <laughs> I'd like to see our guests. Some of them squeal, some, Again, of, them, this is... some of them don't like it, some of them some of them thrive off these. So let's see how we go. Are you oh, I feel br- this is the true the true test of an actor. It would quite, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, but no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Uh, no pressure. If you're not funny or entertaining, it's <laughs> That's like... right. We can we can cut. We can cut this as well. So what do you think? Are you uh, uh, I always start with are you a late night person or an early morning person? Definitely late night. Right. What is your? What do you think is your average sort of right? I probably need to start heading to bed if on an average night. Uh, um, um, I'd like to say eleven, but actually it's midnight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have a favourite season in the year? Oh, uh, spring. Spring. Why is yes. it your? Why is it your favourite? Oh God! It's just oh the colours, the 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 promise of spring. It's uh, um, the flowers, the Oh, I just, it's, it's heady. I just love it. And I particularly love it in the north. I think the, the, um, uh, the seasons here are more, more pronounced, are more dynamic than in South Africa because I think our, our weather isn't as extreme. So, uh, I, I mean, I'm just loving it. Even autumn, it's just magnificent. And actually that leads me rather well onto the next one is where did you grow up? 
in South Africa. There you go. In, in, uh, in a <laughs> I spent most of my youth in a dreadful place in the middle of South Africa called Bloemfontein. And it, it was really conservative. And uh, I, um, I mean, I still had a lot of fun as a child, but it was just, I knew that I didn't belong there. And as soon as I could, um, straight after school, I headed for Cape Town and I went to um, the Uni University of Cape Town, UCT, for, um, to study drama. Mm. If you, as thinking a little bit outside the box, if you had a superpower, what would it be if you could choose your superpower? Ooh, um, um, <laughs> I should say something really more like on the moral high ground, like cure everybody of illnesses, <laughs> but it would probably be to be able to eat all the food that I enjoy in Brussels and, and not put on weight. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good superpower. <laughs> skinny, skinny bitch. <laughs> yeah, skinny bitch superpower. <laughs> Um, did you have a favourite, so personally, did you have a favourite age, a, a favourite decade, a favourite time to be alive? What was your... Ooh, um, um, oh, I loved my time at university, so I suppose the twen in my 20s. In the 20s yeah. um, but I think 30s is also when you kind of, you know, you're more confident and you're really in yourself. And, and also as an actor, I think the 30s are... Or certainly um, for women, so, you know, if we're going to say actors or actors and actresses, um, but uh, I think the 30s is, is actually when you're more in your skin mm. and have a bit more maturity and it's a, an exciting um, time in the, in the industry. Mm. Um, and a final one, do you, in, in terms of the way that you learn i guess this might come up again later on when we talk about the sort of process of, of acting and memorizing and stuff like that learning a role do you learn by watching or doing or writing what's your sort of process in learning um, Have you noticed? i think i'm quite a visual learner um uh but i mean when it comes to learning lines it really is just putting in the work it's just repetition it is, it's just practicing, yeah. practicing, practicing. Um, but I'm definitely, I'm more of a visual learner, so I like to take notes and, you know, see things in front of me. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Michelle, for indulging us in these. I think what... What's always interesting with these these uh, quickfire, actually, Phil, is that we get a little taste of what's to come, I feel. So you've already mentioned a little bit about your background, about where you grew up, about the fact that you, you went to study drama uh, at a university. I'd like to ask you just to, to get to know you a little bit. How did you originally get into acting? What was your first kind of experiences and how did you how did that then become your profession? Well, funnily enough, even in now in my sort of you know, in this place of Bloemfontein, in the middle of South Africa, uh, I had a, a fantastic drama teacher. And I think that always makes such a difference. She was inspiring and she, um, she encouraged me to, to, to you know, to, to follow it. So, um, and then I, I did do productions at school and then um, went off to, to UCT, which at the time was sort of, there weren't that many drama schools. You know, now they're dramas, there are so many options. Um, but it was just absolutely a dream come true. It's um, a very, very good uh, drama school. And did you, I mean, I mean, you could have pursued anything else, but was it for you no, no, no choice in a way? You were just like, this is what I want to do. It was kind of in, in you. Know. Yeah, yeah. I think I was lucky to, uh, it just, it was absolutely what I wanted to do. Um, and I was, yeah, lucky enough to, to be able to go to, to Cape Town. Bef before that, when you were younger, did you sort of have a, uh, were there any thesps in the family or was there any kind of anything that led you to the, <laughs> to the drama? No, <laughs> no, but I think my, my moment when I was my, my brother used to do magic tricks. And so he was the magician. We used to, you know, you know, when you make the family sit down and watch shows, and I was the presenter. 
<laughs> in my little in my little leotard and tights and I just I loved the spectacle and I just yeah and I loved performing I would perform for anybody if they you know if they could bear it um, for neighbors anybody mm -hmm. so um, and of course we didn't I mean we weren't ex it is interesting because we didn't have as much exposure to to all these options I used to love listening to radio the radio plays were were huge um, I used to love listening to radio stories and then um, um, went to theatre. So even from a young age, I used to go, and, I used to, go to the theatre. And so, yeah, just the, the passion just grew from there. Do you, do you remember anything that you still... Do you have, do you have a good... Mem my childhood memory is pretty poor, but I've got a few set scenes that I, that I can recall. Do you remember anything that you went and you thought, gosh, that looks really fun? Um, well, every Christmas we used to we used to go to Cape Town for, uh, to family for Christmas, and my my grandparents always used to buy um, tickets for the the Agatha Christie, and then it was like, oh, and I just oh I just wanted to be on that stage. It was just nice. <laughs> so yeah, that was like a and also going to the ballet. You know, it wasn't only theatre. I just. I just loved the fantasy and the the spectacle and that um, just time that you just you know were taken somewhere else for a while. Loved it. Okay, so and no, go on. Sorry. And I was going to say, and still do. <laughs> I mean, great to hear. I, so my next question, I I don't want to be. Uh pessimistic necessarily but then how do, so you, you you have this dream you you follow your dream how does then uh the reality live up to the dream i guess or i mean st i mean especially in your 20s but then also going forward okay so i was i was very lucky because at the time when i graduated from from drama school um there were um theater companies in South Africa, and I think it's such a shame that so many young people are coming, in, you know, coming to the industry now, and there, there's so few work opportunities. So they, um, you know, they get uh, a tiny part in a film, or but you don't have you don't have time to flex your muscles and to learn. And the best, I think, the best way of learning is watching older actors. So I was very, very lucky because I spent years in a in a theatre company, and I would play anything from, uh, you know, from Ophelia in Hamlet, to to a small walk on role, and you still had to uh, give that one your best shot, and and you know it wasn't a, um, it wasn't about uh, your ego. It was you 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 do your best for each production. And I think that that was such a discipline as a young actor, that uh, to learn that and to watch the older actors, especially in comedy. I mean, to watch exceptionally good comedic actors with timing, oh, it, it's, those, those lessons are priceless. Um, so I think it's a real shame that, um, that young actors struggle to, to um, you know, to really flex their muscles now because there isn't that much work. So you get the job, and then you you know, especially on films. I mean, you could be on set for one day, shoot all your scenes in one day, and that's it. And you haven't had really had time to grow and develop and explore. So I think theatre as a as a as a grounding. Is um, it's just you know so much better for actors for young actors. It's true, isn't it? I guess what you described there is this sort of the idea, which is a little bit. I mean, it does still exist, doesn't it? But the idea of the rep company, the idea of a of a company exactly. of players that do yeah. that, that sort of a cast then in in each show that that particular production company does, which seems to be sort of like I say, it does exist it's in some places, but it's it's not quite so much. Everything's now it's a freelance basis. And like yeah. you say, even though you, you watch a film and you think, gosh, they must have all had a great time hanging out in New Zealand for two years while they filmed Lord of the Rings. And you think, well, actually, a bit part probably flew out for a week, did their yeah. scenes out completely out of order, yeah. so, you know, did the film the last scene first. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. Um, and yeah. Uh, it's, 
it's not like a play. So it's, it's, it, it can be quite lonely, I think. It can be quite a lonely experience when you, when you only come in for mm. your little bit and then leave because you're not, part of the, you're not part of the big picture. You're not part of the big process. You don't sit down with the whole cast and, and, and read, read the, the scenes um, together as you would do in a, in a, in a theatre production where you know, even the walk-on roles, small roles, you'd be at that first reading. So you're sharing and you feel part of the, the creative process. And, and film can be ruthless because you, you, very often you don't even have a rehearsal. You, you come in cold, everyone else has been doing it for weeks or months, and you just, you know, <laughs> Do the lighting, stand in your spot, and whew, you've Go. got to be absolutely <laughs> focused and in the moment. And, and because I think in, in film, more than in theatre, I mean, obviously in theatre, every moment counts too, but you have, every night you have, you have time to, to settle in into your performance. And um, in film, um, every second counts. Because you will not be on that screen if your, if your part, if your contribution isn't vital. Because every, you know, every little bit is important because you've only got you know, that time to tell the story. Um, so uh, it's terrifying because <laughs> you have, it's like right now, while everybody's watching you, you better get it right. <laughs> You're not coming back tomorrow. We're, we're moving. We're, I like that we're kind of moving the conversation onto film, but I do just want to go back to also my reflections. I mean, exactly what you say, Michelle. This this almost community aspect of theatre. That's always what's drawn me to theatre as opposed to film. And this loneliness in film. I think that's something that I also experienced a little bit. And and I okay. And I only did a few little student productions, but I still felt it. You're just on. You have to perform right there. You don't really have this nice rehearsal process where you're exploring exactly. And uh, and I think that's something that the theatre is really yeah is is really nice for and that's something that i also want to create as we go forward with, with the bridge theater and then just to also go back and maybe this is also out of order i think it's really interesting that you you talk about how in south africa you used to more often have these theater companies and again in the uk it was more 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 um prevalent and now we're, we're much more on a freelancer model as it is in Belgium actually it's much more free it's quite freelance based in Belgium but even in Germany which used to have these big companies of, of theatres they're also I feel going more towards a freelance uh, 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 way of working for actors and, and I guess I guess it's it's in a way just economics isn't it it must be very expensive to employ these people all the time on a, on a permanent salary but you still do have this this a little bit in various places in europe germany denmark i think for example uh this kind of more uh, permanent company characteristics which is which is really nice actually yeah and i i think that's um um often why why actors will get together and and just uh, just you know do things for free they'll just uh, because they want to create a community so whether it's doing workshops together or you know just flexing their muscles and um, um, I mean luckily we all see each other at uh, at castings and auditions and things so there's always a sense of you 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 all kind of you are still part of a community even though you you know all having to do your own thing and 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 um, and fight for it but it's it's uh, there is a lovely sense of a of a of a community. Could you perhaps say a bit more about that? So you so you have friends that you because obviously you could like you say with with the freelance lifestyle it could be very isolated and you could almost all feel like you're all fighting over the same job. So you know there's a lot it could potentially potentially a lot of competition. 
But do you also then just seek out, do you recognise in within that group the, the individuals that you'd like to keep at a professional level, that you see them, polite, courteous, etc., you'll work with them fine. But then there are, are there a sort of a select few that, like you say, they're also, they, they cross over into the world of friendship, you you want to collaborate with them, you, you, you work with them a sort of outside of the castings and of the theatre even if you're not being cast in the same things you want to stay in touch with them is that is that sort of absolutely how it works? yeah and a lot of um uh a lot of tears and laughter and yeah it's a tough industry it's really really tough and so um you know sometimes you 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 lucky and land the role but most often than not you don't so you just you just have to um, hang in there and keep going and you prepare for your auditions and you do your best and but I mean that it, it's you there there's so many people going up for the same role um, but I, I I've always loved that I have a very very supportive close circle of friends within the industry and we do we support each other and we each other's like biggest supporters and cheerleaders and so happy for each other you know when 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 things do go well and um and they're to pick up the pieces when they don't um just a lot of commiserating and <laughs> having a good moan every now and then <laughs> it's funny i was speaking of auditions i was chatting with a couple of people yesterday was myself and a, a colleague so two professional singers lots of auditions you know been through the the run of the of the training and all that sort of stuff and now out there and auditioning a lot for everything that you everything that you do and then um, an amateur singer who had been asked to go and audition for a big choral society um, he put it in, in it was quite an interesting conversation because the way that he spoke of auditions and he, we both we, we all three agreed that it was a nervous process that it wasn't something that we particularly relished maybe some people do no. like auditions i think they're mad no um but uh, the the amateur singer um spoke of auditions in terms of are you good enough to come into my choir whereas i think at some point if you're going to make it your profession you almost have to be so you're not taking it so personally every time because like you say it might i remember my one of my teachers used to say look if you go for 10 auditions if one of them is successful it, it might not even be for the thing that you've auditioned for but it might be for yeah. the next thing that they're doing then you're on a good track that's good odds yeah um but at some point in your professional career you've got to turn it on its head and it's not about am i good enough to work with you but do i fit with what you want do i fit with your other people that you've cast do i does my voice Absolutely. work in your ensemble does my face work on in your screen, am mm. I the right size for this role? Cast against mm. this other person, you know, and and I think mm. that's sort of fairly important to, to to switch it like that, so that it's you don't feel constantly like, am I good enough? You're just saying yeah. I am good enough, but do I fit? <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely, because it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a quality. You bring a certain quality, and it um, um, and especially if you're playing. In, in bigger roles and your and the chemistry between the the leads or the um, you know just the dynamic it just it just has to fit mm. just has to fit um, I mean maybe maybe a question to both of you I mean it's interesting what you say for I really like it I, I wonder at what point you felt that switch uh, in, in in thinking and I wonder to both of you whether you think the the constant rejection does have an impact on you. On your, on your mental health, I, I I'll, do, I'll be yeah I'll be I'll be quick. I think my I think my answer sort of came to me. I, I think uh, look going through the sort of further education side of the arts, you spot sometimes there are two or three people in your class in your year group who don't have the filter. They they seem to be uh, uh, inherently successful. They land the auditions and they do. It. And I think possibly because they've already come with a either with a bit of a tinge of arrogance or just with all, already this sort of unnerving kind of like. I'm not here to prove myself. I've done that, so I'm here to, you know, I, I've got a different mindset already. I, I wasn't like that at all. I was, I was still, I still, um, I still do get nervous about auditions, and you do have to be sort of fairly, I don't know, careful, thoughtful about the process, so that you don't become this nervous wreck every time you have to do one. Um, but I think it was, for me was having left education and then a couple of years down the line, and I think I'd probably done a couple of things that just cemented in my mind. You're good enough, uh, you know. You're this. You are a professional artist in whatever you know, whatever field you're working in, um, and and that's and and for me then it was it wasn't a sort of one day I was like right, you know, I've made the website, 
<laughs> and I am now professional. It was it was after years of, of graft, and then I think these sort of milestones, these increments, you just start to feel more and more capable, I suppose, more and more kind of, yeah, I can do that. That's that's for me. I could totally do this role. Um, and so it was a gradual process. And I think now, even though now the boat rocks occasionally, and sometimes you get that rejection and you think, oh, wow. Right, better pack it all in then. <laughs> do something else. Um, but those, those, those are fewer and far between now, fortunately. I don't know, Michelle, what do you think? Was there a moment for you that it switched and you were like, right, professional now? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I ever, if I ever, I think because I, because I, because I started off um, already part of a professional troupe, uh, it was, um, it was easier to feel professional because I was constantly working. But I think the insecurity and the vulnerability has never left me. But I, I think... I think maybe um, the performers that are make that do make themselves vulnerable are, are perhaps more interesting to watch because they're more human and they're more open and they 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 don't feel like they've just you know got their got their performance together and it's all um, exactly the same every night because it's perfect and that there's some kind of um, um, a room for for fragility and openness and um, but I think it's really really important that actors have something else outside of of their profession because if you rely on that for your self-worth it you know you could you could fall apart because it's 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 such a roller coaster and you could have a really good year and then the next year you could have very little um, work so so I think it would be very dangerous to use that as a as a measure of your success or your capability, or um, because it's it's so it's so unpredictable. And I think as as we get older, and especially as a as a as a woman, I mean, it, the roles just get fewer and fewer, and it's it's a cruel industry. Um, so um, you know, it it it's especially on film if you. It works to have people who look good on film. Um, uh, so the roles are, are fewer and far between for, for, for aging actresses. <laughs> so that in itself, I mean, you, if, you, if, you, if you had to take all of that to heart, I mean, you'd be a, you know, a wreck. <laughs> Forget, well, I, I dare say we'll come back to that but before we, we forget about it what's your you mentioned there having something else as well what is your uh, something else well your... I, I think I'm, I'm I'm very lucky because I've had a, um, a very full happy family life um, also lots of good friends but um, I'm I've been married to my childhood sweetheart and uh, and I have two sons um, who kept me on my toes and just, you know, there was so much, there was so much busyness and joy and uh, sort of delightful stuff going on behind the scenes that it wasn't centre court. I mean, of course, I was heartbroken if I didn't get a role that I really, really wanted. But, but you know. I had to uh, do grocery shopping and cook supper and life goes on. And, you know, and of course they, they always thought that their needs were much more important than mine anyway. So <laughs> you couldn't get too self-indulgent if you're a parent that you just, you know, there's no time for that. Really, really nice. I, I think, yes, I think what you said about the unpredictability of everything, I think that is something that, that was the reason why I left. I think I, I just felt so out of control with 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 everything because you're you're literally in the hands of other people who are deciding whether you're going to get this this job and whether you're going to get that paycheck i know that's kind of the case with every single industry but i think again just because you're changing jobs possibly more 
uh, as a freelance uh, performer, then you're you're just subject to the process more often and uh, to someone else's almost whim uh, a little bit. Um, but I, I would like to, you, you are touching on, on this a little bit, but I'd like to ask you if you could describe how you see the difference between uh, what is an actor and what is someone who acts? Well, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure if this is, but my, my impression would be that an actor is somebody who, who, who's doing it as a business. So it's, it's work. It's, uh, it is fun and we do have a lot of fun, but it, it's your job. So you take it seriously and um, there's a huge respect for the industry. Whereas I think a lot of people can do acting as a hobby, um, and which is fantastic and a beautiful creative outlet. But I, I don't think it's the same if you're, you know, if you're not relying on it as your, as your income and as your job. You have to have a level of professionalism um, and accountability and it's you know it's there's a lot of money at stake when you when you um, when you're part of a, a production or a or a or a or a big film so you you have to be you're accountable you know you have to <laughs> deliver the goods because they're relying on you uh, you're now a th freelance artist is that right yes Yes. Totally freelance. So, what, uh, how did that work? At what point did you sort of shift? Is it when you came up to, to Europe or? Oh what, what no, um, um, uh, the decision was made for me very early. I'm afraid the the theatre companies were um, we were all retrenched many years ago. I mean, I'm talking twenty. This was uh, I was actually pregnant with Josh, and he is my elder son, and so and he's um, twenty seven. Right. So, so there were no more um, state-funded theatre companies, and so we went. We all went freelance from there, and then so that's that's when things got a bit tricky for me because I had a, you know, um, family and s small children. I wasn't able to go on tour, and that's the you know that's the tough thing um, is that. For theatre especially, you have to be able to go on tour. So as a mother, that was really, really hard for me. I tried it and it was just, oh, you know, it was just impossible to be away for three weeks. Um, so that affected my, my decisions hugely. So I chose to do um, more educational theater, which was absolutely fantastic. So it was a different kind of theater company, but um, we, we would go out to schools and we would go to, to really, really um, poor schools where there wasn't a blade of grass, um, quite sort of, um, you know, you can imagine like really um, stark buildings, very urban environment and um, mm. and you'd think, oh God, here we go, we're doing Shakespeare. We, we used to do the, the, um, the set works, so it would be whatever the Shakespeare was and at the time it was Othello and, um, and the Great Gatsby. And um, <laughs> I would think, oh my God, how is this going to work? And yet, if there was a if there was a, a passionate English teacher, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing how you could get you could get um, young students involved and interested, or scholars, um, uh, in in Shakespeare. And, and in such a completely different time and environment, but it worked. It absolutely worked. Kids are amazing for that. I've just just last week I was up delivering my an education uh, program that I run up in Leeds, and we go to schools all over Leeds and Yorkshire, um, and and some which are um, in recognised areas of, of sort of social deprivation seems like a, a horrible word but I think that's what it's officially called a quite poor area should we say um, and we take art song to them classical song Schubert Schumann Amazing. also the modern composers Richard Rodney Bennett Britain etc um, we sing at them in German the Okernik and they get it and they love it mm. and their eyes and their faces are wide open what's that sound it's it's both wonderful and like you say if if they've got that supportive environment if they've got a great teacher who says this is something different, and you're going to love it. Here we go, you know. Mm. And or, and if, as long as the school itself is is that supportive environment, then they they just mm. accept they'll just accept it. 
Um, but it's also slightly sad that it's so special, that it's so, oh, wow, you know. It's like it's a bit of a shame that you don't hear this all the time. More know. often, you know, that it's not I those know. opportunities out there. It, I, it's for such me, important work. it was just such a humbling experience because I just realised that, you know, how privileged I'd been. I'd, I'd gone to the theatre from when I was a little girl. I'd gone to watch the ballet, I'd gone to the theatre. It was just something we did. And I was lucky enough to be exposed to it from such a young age. Um, and for, for, for most youngsters, I think, you know, they just rely on television for entertainment. Um, and so it was, it was so rewarding to see how <laughs> these, these young teenagers could get so involved in Iago. And like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> They were completely invested. It was just delicious. And I remember, I remember watching, sort of seeing the change in their body language, you know, from sitting back and being completely disinterested and that sort of, I mean, you know, not quite chewing gum, but, you know, that kind of feeling. Mm. Sort of like, oh, God, here we go. I'm going to have to watch this for the next 45 minutes. And then watching them sort of coming in but but more and then leaning in. And then eventually it was sort of like, you know, like <laughs> speaking out loudly. <laughs> it was just, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It just warmed my heart. So even though I wasn't able to do um, main stage theatre for many, many years because I, I didn't want to um, tour, uh, this made my heart sing. I just loved it. It's such, as you say, fulfilling, rewarding, but important work as well. And I think that when you do that sort of stuff, you're planting a seed in pretty much all of them. So some of those kids, what, a few of them might have gone on to become English scholars, actors themselves, Shakespeare scholars. Many of them, you'd have just brought out, a, you'd, they, you'd have just shown them something different, a different way to be. Yeah. Uh, you'd have given them yeah. skills in presentation, to, you know, had deportment and, and speaking and that sort of stuff. You know, there's so many skills that the arts yeah. can offer yeah. young people, and not just young people. <laughs> no, of, oh, absolutely. And also another thing that was just quite interesting was, of course, in the context of South Africa, and this was, um, you know, uh, uh, 25, 27 years ago that I was doing a lot of this, and, um, and playing Desdemona, and... Um, and my my fellow actor Cizwe playing playing um, Othello, we, we you know we'd have a good kiss as 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 the couple, and the sh the kids were just like, <gasps> wow, you know what have we just seen? So you know even just that little just that little um, stirring of sort of like wow, okay, this is interesting and different, um, and. Uh, you know, Caesar and I'd have a good giggle, and sort of this was sort of <laughs> pushing social boundaries. Um, basically. Yeah, half, you know, half past eight on a Monday morning, and <laughs> we, that got their attention. Like, whoa. <laughs> On to to later, I guess, in your life. So you started obviously in this in this theatre company. You went into educational theatre. At some point, you started doing more film, from what I understand. So how did it? Was that a natural transition, or did that did something switch again? Was there a new phase? Uh, I, I I think it had something to do with uh, what was going on in South Africa. That suddenly it was opening up, and more people were looking at South Africa um, uh, as a you know, a good place for filming. So there were more opportunities. Uh, um, but then uh, I, I think as an industry, people were also uh, writing for film and making more film and being exposed to, to better techniques and styles and, and some um, film acting schools opened up. So it was just, you know, it was just becoming more popular. So um, I was very... <laughs> I was very lucky. I was ca called for an audition, and and I'd I'd only been sent the side, so I you know we don't receive the whole script. You only get sent your sides, and um, and I thought, gosh, this is this is lovely. By, by sides, Michelle Mead's pages of the script. And I thought, gosh, this is 
these are some lovely scenes and I, and I like this and I knew nothing about the project and I went to the audition and it was this, this young man and I thought he was a, a student, like maybe an honours student and this was his student piece and I thought, no, 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 I'm, you know, I give back, I give back to the, to the, to the community and I don't, I'll, I'll do this, I'm, sh I'm sure we pro probably won't even get paid but it doesn't matter, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this one, I like it and I really liked him, loved the way he was directing me in the, in the audition and anyway, I got the role. Turns out that that was the, the role of Elena in, in Squinate, which is um, beauty. And we went to the Cannes Film Festival with this piece. It was a co-production with a French company. And this, what I thought was a student, is Oliver Hermanus is a wonderful director. And he was just very young when he, when he wrote this. And, and uh, we actually went on to win the Queer Palm Award at the Cannes Film Festival. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really shows. It really shows you. You, you should. You, and I think I've said this to you before, Michelle. You should never underestimate who's in the room, right? You, you really don't know. Mm. 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 And I'm quite sure I was quite condescending and saying, like, "Yeah, this is well done. It's a lovely, lovely script. You've really, yeah, you've done well. Good for you. Good for you." <laughs> Meanwhile, now he's sort of like. <laughs> He's a um, you know, very respected director and um, yeah, I was just very, very lucky and that was a surreal experience. It was completely surreal um, because for a moment in time we had like a little taster of, of that um, elusive kind of, you know, I don't know, being a, a star or something. It was very fleeting, it was very fleeting. But it was very cool just to have it, just to experience it, because we were we were collected from the hotel in these, um, you know, the the official cars with the logo and the tinted windows, <laughs> and then the public thought we may be famous, but I mean nobody knows who we are. But we, you know, there's just a possibility that we may be well known. <laughs> so people were taking photographs, and then you do the whole red carpet thing, and you do the 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 press and they all stand there and they call your name. It's Michel, Michel. And he's like, tch, 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 tch. And the cameras are flashing. <laughs> and then the, my best was the security guys, of course, being, you know, being France, being Cannes, they had these gorgeous, these dishy security men in these, in these sort of cream um, linen suits with their little earpieces. And, you know, there was just security everywhere. And we were being led off and, um, and you know, looking after us like we these real stars. And then the next day, we were like, nobody, nobody cared, nobody paid us any attention. And what's that? Like, oh, Where's my red it's carpet? It's me. Today? I was like, nah, gone. I suppose <laughs> your moment is over. I suppose that's that's another big difference uh, between the worlds of, of theatre and film, isn't it? The the sort of the perceived glitz and glamour of it all. I, I suppose we've we've mm. seen in in recent years the sort of the veil being removed maybe from some of that and, and sometimes the award ceremonies don't quite go to plan or, or whatever but um oh gosh it's yes not quite the, had a few of those it's that and also like you said earlier about the, the process of it you know the fact that a film is you know you're, you're not all together all the time you're not all working together like you do in theater you're not all at the first read through for example um yes it's it's yeah it's quite it's quite a different industry actually isn't it with film and theater Yes. I think what I've also realized is budget. Yeah. Budget makes all the difference. So, so for instance, um, that experience was, uh, we, because it was a co-production with France, with a French uh, production company, we, we actually had rehearsals. Mm which is such a privilege on film. So Oliver actually spent time with us um, exploring uh, different ways of playing this. And then even, and then even on the day, on, du during the shoot, we had more time. Um, so the lighting was beautiful. Lighting is everything in film. And 
uh, there was just more time, and even you know we could we could redo a scene. We had we had opportunity to do lots of takes, um, whereas on low budget films it is, but you can have just as much fun. I was in a film called Scheme where we were all on set all the time because it was this godforsaken like a little um, um, a holiday a camping kind of place or with chalets, but it's sort of can be a bit seedy and we were all there all the time for the shoot and that was also so much fun and it was mostly night shoots but on a really really tiny tiny budget but there it was you know a, a medium shot one shoot one take for your close-up maybe two if you were lucky and that's it moving on that's it and I was like <laughs> but it's exhilarating in a different way. Um, but certainly the experience on, on, on Squinate was exceptional. And then again, um, uh, oh, I was so lucky. I got, the, got a role. It's a tiny role, but it's a really, really special, special role in, in Long Walk to Freedom with Idris Elba, mm -hmm. who playing Mandela. And that was... That was incredible. That was a really, really special experience um, to, to honor the great Nelson Mandela, but also um, because, again, it was, a, it was a class act. You know, it was everything, the attention to detail, the wardrobe, the... Um, um, my scene is set in the 50s when he was a, when Mandela was a, um, a practicing lawyer so it's a courtroom scene but even my even my underwear my undergarments were authentic mm -hmm. and it just it just adds so much to your performance because immediately if your your hair's done in a, in the in the style in the period um, you're wearing the different underwear, so you hold yourself differently. The shoes from the period, you immediately, like half your work is done for you because in your preparation, feeling different gives you a different impulse. And when you're wearing clothes that make you stand differently, you, it's so much easier to imagine yourself in the time and how women behaved and and we car you know, women carried themselves differently because they were restricted by their underwear. And even more so if you do period pieces, like really sort of in, in, in theater, you know, to wear a corset and to have all those undergarments and the um, and accessories like fans or how, you know, the, the, the language of how to use a fan. I mean, all these things are, they're delicious, um, um, it's, 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 it's like little, they, they're just props, but they actually are details that really add to your character and you behave differently. So you use your imagination, you imagine yourself at, in that time, um, but it's really helped if you've got a good, a good support team, mm. War, um, makeup, hair and wardrobe. It's wonderful to hear you speak, Michelle. And I think, regrettably, we're kind of running out of time. But I oh. feel like we're scratch. I feel like we've scratched the surface, and that we we just got to get you back because it's lovely to hear your your, your chat, oh. and particularly about going in there about the detail of of. I think because this is where, as Ed says, we've we've not yet had someone who's um, who's on stage really. That the whole podcast has been about the sort of backstage process. But actually, what you're talking about here not only in the way that your career is formed and how it's morphed throughout your life, but also, I mean, there's so many questions I want to ask you about being a mum and working in theatre and what's it like to be on tour when you moved up to Brussels, what your, what's, you know, what's your process in getting into... But it would, I think that might be the subject of, of the next time that we, that we three get together because it's just lovely to hear well, you talk about it. And... Thank you very much. I'd love that. So thank you so, so much, Michelle, for coming on the show today. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Oh, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you. And Phil, we'll see each other next month. Yeah, looking forward to it.